Thank you to Yvette and the other organizers, along with the Rwandan Embassy and Ambassador Kimonio, for inviting me here today to participate in commemorating the Rwandan genocide. Next slide. Thank you to, as well to Georgetown University for hosting this important event. Before I begin, I want to extend my most heartfelt sympathies to all of you who survived the genocide and to you who lost family and friends during it. As a citizen of a country that could have, but chose not to help, I'm especially and deeply sorry. Next. Today I'll discuss the role of media and literature immediately before and during the 1994 Rwandan genocide with some concluding thoughts about the present day. Dr. Gallimore will focus his remarks on contemporary freedom of expression and issues. Immediately before and during the genocide, Hutu hardliners monopolized and manipulated print and broadcast media in Rwanda. The newspaper Kangura and other periodicals, as well as radio television Livre de Claudine, RTLM, or Hate Radio, and Radio Rwanda were, quote, voices of extremism. Not only did these media outlets spew virulent anti Tutsi propaganda that incited the genocide, but they also distributed specific instructions that directly helped execute these atrocities. Even years before the Rwandan genocide, Kungura, meaning wake others up in Kenya, Rwanda, and other prominent newspapers and journals in Rwanda began pro printing articles and cartoons that were unapologetically and unambiguously anti-RPF and anti-Tutsi. Some examples. Kungura falsely asserted the following, often projecting onto Tutsi exactly the preparations and acts of Hutu genocidaire. That Tutsi infiltrated and disproportionately occupied, if not dominated, positions of economic, social, political, and religious influence. That Tutsi women were devious and deadly seductresses of Hutu men. That Tutsi were planning a genocidal war on Hutu that would leave no survivors. That RPF soldiers admitted that they had come to clean the country of the filth of Hutu. That, that Tutsi resembled Nazis in their ideology and even adopted the Nazi swastika as their emblem. And that Tutsi are cannibals. Next. Perhaps the most famous example of Kungura's incitement is its cover from December 1993, four months before the genocide erupted. The cover contains four elements. The first is a photo of Gregoire Kayibanda, who was mentioned in the previous presentation, a former president of Rwanda who promoted Hutu majority power. A second is a sarcastic headline referring to Tutsi as the race of God. The following question, what weapons can be used to finally defeat the Nyenzi? Meaning cockroach is one of many derogatory words used against Tutsi. And finally, as if to offer an answer to that question, a picture of a machete, one of the primary weapons that would soon be used to perpetrate the genocide. Radio was even more effective means of communication than print media because of the relatively low literacy rate in Rwanda, at least as compared to Western standards. Relatedly, there's a traditional and popular oral culture in Rwanda. Also, relatedly, many Rwandans own uh, radios. And finally, the government reportedly distributed free radios before and possibly even during the genocide. Radio Rwanda, the national radio, was used as a mouthpiece of the government. It sometimes broadcasted inaccurate information. Because Rwandans had little access to independent media sources, the veracity of these claims were left unchecked. For example, in 1992, Radio Rwanda falsely declared that Tutsi were planning to kill certain Hutu leaders, an allegation Radio Rwanda said a Kenya-based human rights group warned about. Some suspect Radio Rwanda intended to encourage Hutu to slaughter Tutsi, which Hutu began doing the following day. RTLM was established in 1993 by pro-Hutu forces and, be and began broadcasting later that year. One of the RTLM founders was Simon, was Simon Bikindi, a popular musician famous for his anti-Tutsi songs. The lyrics of one song included, in reference to Tutsi, remember this evil that should be driven as far away as possible so that it never returns to Rwanda. 
RTLM became very popular among Who Too because it played lively music, it showcased gossip, and it reported supposed news that was often untrue and interviews that were often inaccurate. Before April 6th, 1994, RTLM actively incited the genocide. RTLM dehumanized and demonized Tutsi. The following are portions of RTLM broadcasts. You find Tutsi look hideous with their bushy hair and beards that are full of fleas. They look like animals. Actually, they are animals. The Tutsi cockroaches are bloodthirsty murderers. They dissect their victims, extracting their vital organs, heart, liver, and stomach. They are man-eating cockroaches. The Tutsi cockroaches are ferocious beasts, the most vicious of hyenas, more cunning than the rhino. The Tutsis have always been evil. They may smile and wink, but they will take their children away. We can't tell them, we can't let them attack our country. I'm asking everybody to stand up and fight using everything you have. We must take sticks, clubs, and machetes and stop them from destroying our country. RTLM exploited tension between ethnic groups to promote or reaffirm Hutu fears of Tutsi, that Tutsi were threatening and would not peacefully share power. On April 6, 1994, when the plane carrying the Rwandan president, Juvenal Habariamana, a Hutu was shot down, RTLM blamed the, RT, the RPF. RTLM broadcasted, the cockroach's cruelty is irreversible. The only remedy is total ex extermination. Kill them all. Totally wipe them out. Beyond inciting the genocide, the media was instrumental in, in, in orchestrating the atrocities. After the genocide erupted exactly 18 years ago, radio became even more important as a source of information and analysis for Rwandans than before the genocide, since the conflict inhibited travel and access to outside media. Officials of the interim government told Rwandans to listen to radio broadcasts. RTLM urged Hutu to kill Tutsi. For example, RTLM broadcast, the graves are not yet full. Who is going to do the good work and help us fill them completely? RTLM also directed listeners to construct roadblocks and to search for Tutsi generally and RTLM specifically named individuals and areas that should be targeted. Radio Rwanda, the national radio station, aired similar instructions and information. Given the popularity and effectiveness of especially RTLM, what could or perhaps should outside actors have done? One option would have been to jam radio broadcasts. The United States and perhaps other countries reportedly considered doing so, however they ultimately decided not to. A, section, a, section option, a second option would have been to destroy radio stations and their infrastructure throughout the country. And I'd like at this moment just to take issue with something that President Clinton said in the documentary Ghosts of Rwanda. It is factually untrue that the United States government did not know uh, what was happening as it was occurring. Skeptics then, and even some now, raised counter-arguments about these proposals. One was a general aversion to humanitarian intervention. Those who refused to intervene in the genocide did not want to pursue even minimal steps that could be accomplished without committing soldiers on the ground. Another counter-argument concerned freedom of speech. The idea that words alone and that people have the right to say whatever they want, regardless of how controversial it may be, and without regard to consequences. Of course, there are compelling responses to these counter-arguments. With regard to anti-intervention, just like bombing train tracks to Auschwitz could have helped mitigate the Holocaust, so too would have jamming or destroying RTLM. Moreover, the freedom of speech should have, uh, should have reasonable limits, an issue addressed explicitly after the genocide. Next. Between 1996 and 1997, the UN International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda indicted and then jointly tried three Rwandan media officials for committing atrocity crimes. Next. 
These three individuals were Jean Bosco Baraya Guizo and Ferdinand Nahimana, who were both co-founders and senior officials of RTLM, and Hassan Ngezi, who was the founder and editor-in-chief of Kangoro. Oh, actually, no, sorry, go back. Sorry. In pronouncing their convictions and sentences, the trial judges stated, quote, without a firearm, machete, or any physical weapon, you caused the deaths of thousands of innocent civilians. This case raises important principles concerning the role of the media, which have not been addressed at the, local, at, at the level of international criminal justice since Nuremberg. The power of the media to create and destroy fundamental human values comes with great responsibility. Those who control the media are accountable for its consequences. At the end of their trial and their appeal came the following convictions. Barai Guiza was convicted for instigating the perpetration of acts of genocide and ordering or instigating the commission of crimes against humanity. Nahimana was convicted of direct and public incitement to commit genocide and crimes against humanity. And Ngeze was, uh, was convicted of aiding and abetting the commission of genocide, direct and public incitement to commit genocide, and also aiding and abetting crimes against humanity. These trials acknowledge the role the media can play in promoting and perpetrating atrocities and established important precedents in international law that criminalize genocidal hate speech. Hopefully these cases will deter others who may consider using media to incite and orchestrate genocide. Next. Today there are other signs beyond these legal developments that Rwanda has begun a new chapter in its history. After a catastrophic history of propaganda, Rwanda is increasingly committed to free and open access to ideas and information which are critical to combating myths and misunderstandings that can lead to violence. A few examples. The UN estimates that the adult literacy rate in Rwanda today is between 70 and 80 percent. This figure is significantly higher than the 40 percent, the 47 percent adult literacy rate in 1985. Next. The first national public library will soon be inaugurated in Rwanda. After a 10-year-long fundraising campaign, the Kigali Public Library, a three-story building that will hold approximately 25,000 books and partner with other libraries around the country and across the region, will provide unfettered access to a treasure trove of resources previously unavailable in Rwanda. This is the architectural rendering of the library. Next. I've been involved uh, in the initiative for over a decade. Next. This is the foundation being laid. Next. The frame, the frame of the building. Next. Another, another view of the frame. Next. This is the front entrance as it looks today. Next. Another view of the front entrance. Next. This is the side view today. Next. This is the roof. Inside on the front on the first floor. Next. Another view from inside. Also inside. So I've only had about 15 minutes uh, to speak, um, and of course there's much more to discuss about media and literature uh, in Rwanda, including about genocide denialism since 1994, the growth of diverse media inside Rwanda, the controversial role of Hollywood and other outside media in portraying the history of Rwanda through popular films such as Hotel Rwanda, and the use of ethnic, the use and abuse of ethnic vocabulary in contemporary Rwandan society. I'll, lead, I'll need to leave these important topics for another time, and thank you once again for having me here today. Uh, it's been a true privilege. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation, and I want to start by also expressing my condolences to those of you in the audience who have lost members of your family and your friends during the genocide. And I know that as a public commemoration of what happened 18 years ago, we all come to share in the history and building a better future. But we cannot overlook the personal loss and grief that you continue to bear each and every day. And I don't take that lightly or say that as just an open remark because we need never forget the human dimension of those who suffered in 1994 and continue to suffer today, even though there is progress in the country and progress in reconciliation and otherwise, your personal loss remains with us and we uh, recognize that today and uh, pause to give you 
a kind of uh, kudos, if you will, for continuing and being able even to participate in ceremonies and recognitions like this. Now, as the previous speaker has said, there's much that has happened in Rwanda since 1994 along the lines of media. And I'll focus on today and forward. As you saw on his uh, presentation, the role of the media during the uh, 1994 leading up was to really prepare the population for uh, participating in the uh, mass slaughter that happened through propaganda, manipulation, and so forth. Now, I don't have the advantage of having the slides in front of me, so I'm going to have to look behind sometimes to see where we are. So Rwanda's challenge now is how to present an accurate history of what has happened, how to combat a couple of grievous challenges within the society, that is, combating genocide ideology, the denial of genocide, while at the same time building a framework of freedom of expression that will respect that right and other human rights that supposedly hang on freedom of expression. This is the history that we've just heard about, and I characterize that history as an abuse of freedom of expression that helped to facilitate the genocide in 1994. The ICTR media case you have heard about, and I had the uh, privilege of working on some of the documentation on this and even uh, doing some background research on what happened in this case and the meaning of it. Unfortunately, the previous speaker did mention many of those convictions were overturned on appeal so that those individuals who misused the media in 1994, the convictions that stand today have to do with their personal involvement in the genocide rather than what they did through the media. So at the beginning there was a kind of, uh, if you will, uh, victory for those who wanted to look at limitations of the press, but unfortunately, in my opinion, the appeals uh, chamber of the tribunal reversed those convictions. So even though it's called the media case, we truly don't have any outstanding convictions based on the activities and the misuse of the media in 1994. Independent researchers in Rwanda have since then documented the existence of genocide ideology and denial of genocide in Rwanda. And I want to focus both on the internal dynamics in the country and also externally because we know those of us who are outside of Rwanda have our part to play in uh, the reconciliation and the progress of the country just as we had our part to play in prevention and uh, stopping the genocide and did not step up to that role. Rwanda faces this continuing threat of uh, those individuals who have said, even in public broadcasts, that they intend to finish the job that was started in 1994. Those of us who here in the West have the luxury and the distance, if you will, of talking about freedom of expression in a very isolated way, in a kind of calm, peace, and safety. But this is a real ongoing threat inside the country of those who have their minds made up that if given a chance, they would continue with the extermination that started in 1994. Having that knowledge and based upon the research that was done by uh, the government, the parliament, independent research institutes in the country, the government of Rwanda took the step of uh, criminalizing what is called genocide ideology, genocide denial, minimization, support everything that you could do to say that killing individuals based on their ethnicity and the other uh, characteristics that are outlawed in the Genocide Convention, the government has closed those doors in domestic law. Now, unfortunately, there are some individuals, critics, political opponents, who have been using the internet, using uh, traditional media, criticizing the genocide denial law, the genocide ideology law, as a, a tool of the present government for political suppression. They are also engaged in a very organized, concerted effort to deny that the genocide happened in Rwanda. And that takes the form of double genocide, uh, questioning the number of victims who were killed, uh, mixing and convoluting who did what and when, so that not only outright denial, but minimization, recharacterization of what happened. This is the strategy, very subtle, and they've been very successful, if you look at social media today, 
in getting that message out, not only in Rwanda, but in the rest of the world, so that the dominant picture that's out there is one other than what we know to be the documented truth. That's a discussion, especially in social media, is taking place today. A number of these voices have influenced reporters at the New York Times, people who give recognitions and prizes and media organizations and Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International, those people who control, if you will, the knowledge-making industry in the Western world have been influenced by this campaign and these voices that have cast out and to discuss and minimize and outline the, the genocide against the New York Times. People who give recognition One of the main prizes and media organizations and human rights and, and Amnesty International. Those people who control who not even the use knowledge the making industry in the, in the Western legal world have been influenced by this campaign and these voices that have cast doubt on Spurgeon and have minimized the and outright the denied killings, but the they would not use that word. So this didn't start by uh, individuals who one are of the main clients on to say genocide uh, sophisticated and these are people who do very well with their some other than the killings, killings but they would not use that word. So this didn't start by what uh, happened in individual groups of the moved and on social media uh, sophisticated and these were people who have taken up the cause. And one of the things that those social critics media and opponents have been said successful taken up is the cause. And one of the things that media to those use critics the language and opponents have been have successful in starting with the is getting the attorney, traditional media to uh, use to the language there is that they not have a starting space. with the ICTR in Rwanda to discuss and debate. And if you do a content analysis of those people who are, uh, we would call genocide deniers, and then look at media coverage and some of the uh, think tanks in Washington and in New York and elsewhere, and see how much they parrot those exact phrases, those exact terms of those who are trying to minimize, negate, and deny the genocide. Human Rights Watch and its various reports I'm not saying it's a total watch, but they have done some good things. But if you look very carefully at the Human Rights Watch campaign, those detractors and deniers are starting to have influence on the conclusions that they draw and the types of analysis that they do to report about uh, Rwanda. The New York Times has a very close relationship with Human Rights Watch. It's a circle of one person quotes the other, the New York Times repeats it, and whether or not that claim is authenticated or not, it's presented to the general public as true. And I've done a study of this circular argument and uh, infusion of the genocide minimization denial by way of Human Rights Watch and the New York Times reporting. Amnesty International and its various reports on what's going on with the genocide ideology law and the uh, genocide denial law picks up some, again, the language of these people who would try to detract and diminish and minimize what happened. Uh, reporters Without Order, even so, uh, making the main claim that uh, there is government suppression going on by way of the genocide ideology law that was created. Policy advocacy organization, Atlantis Foundation, for example, was mentioned before as uh, one that had really gone forward with the views and the uh, opinions of others who are on this campaign of genocide denial and genocide minimization. Next. One of the reasons we see that, and it needs more analysis and discussion, even from those of you here who are conversant with Rwanda, what happened in 1994, is to look at how we make analyses and discussions and reporting on what happened in Rwanda and how the country is trying to rebuild and move forward. That is, we take our standards here in the West, our ideological hegemony, and place that on Rwanda and say, as we have evolved, as we have developed, we expect you to go through this despite the fact that you have different circumstances and different challenges. And so this kind of interpretation and implementation of human rights, very broadly defined, of which freedom of expression is considered centrally, presents some problems when you look at the genocide ideology law uh, that Rwanda has promulgated. We also see this absolutist view that we take, especially in the United States, about freedom of expression comes above everything, and uh, we need not uh, touch those who want to say, deny, minimize, or involve in any kind of discussion that they please. Now, I have put this slide on to show you that this so-called double standard that I've talked about before in different form 
exists. When you look at Rwanda's genocide ideology law and its denial law, it's not uncommon considering the ones that are in Israel, in Germany, in France, and in many other countries in the uh, European uh, Union. Uh, a recent development in Australia was the case of ETOC versus Bolt, where an anti-discrimination law was considered upheld by the courts in Australia saying that freedom of expression does not allow a journalist to make uh, characterizations and accusations about ethnicity in a society and to insult members of the society. Freedom of expression has that limit. The next one that I think is most prominent and appropriate for our context is our own uh, restriction on threatening the life of the President of the United States or anyone in succession of uh, the presidency. I talked about this uh, several months ago and then just in January of this year we have a very prominent case that has been swept on the rug a bit of a, a Jewish newspaper in Atlanta. The editor wrote an editorial that was characterized as a threat to the life of uh, President Obama. And this incident has been investigated by the Secret Service and other law enforcement. And the editor has since uh, resigned from that paper. The point of this is that we have recognized in our own society that there are limits to what you can say. This part of the US code says that you cannot threaten the life of the president. The genocide ideology law, the genocide uh, denial law in Rwanda says that you cannot threaten and intimidate populations, groups in a society. And somehow Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, and some of these other organizations find those kinds of prohibition in the context of genocide to be illegitimate when we have here in the most stable democracy with the longest history of freedom of expression limitations on a certain kind of speech when it comes to threatening the life of a, life of a single individual and we find those to be acceptable limits because if you talk about someone in a remote part of Rwanda saying that I'm going to go out and finish the job then they're criticized, the government is criticized for saying that speech ought not to be allowed in the society in the context of genocide. Thanks. Recognizing that the international community did not do what it should have to respond to the rhetoric in Bosnia and in Rwanda in the uh, 1990s, the months preceding genocide. Next. The Secretary General of the United Nations, that's Kofi Annan at the time, said that maybe under the uh, responsibility to protect doctrine, Governments can and should ban expression that could incite violence. And so we have, as a developing regime, looking at differences in our societies, especially those recovering from genocide, setting these limits, as the previous speaker has mentioned, about what is tolerable speech in a society versus things that will plunge the society back into division, back into hatred, back even into the recurrence of genocide. Rwanda has acted responsibly if you take the present regime of what is allowable to promulgate these laws, even though they have limitations of freedom of expression, so as to fulfill its responsibility, uh, next slide, to prevent the recurrence of genocide, fulfill its responsibility to rebuild a society after the genocide in 1994. The challenge now remains for Rwanda, given how the international legal regime on freedom of expression has evolved, given those limitations that have been set in Israel, in Germany, in France, even those that we recognize in the United States. How can this country, coming out of this terrible past, the abuse of freedom of expression and the need to promulgate freedom of expression as much as possible, tailor the genocide denial law, the genocide ideology law, to allow for historical, political, and scientific discussion of the subject that does not go over into what we call incitement, as we saw in 93 and 94. And so those limits on freedom of expression and the role of the media in carrying the voices of people who disagree and who want to talk about the history, how do you have a discussion and debate of the history and the present without allowing what happened in 93, 94 to happen? To, to recur, that is now I'm going to be targeting, I'm going to be persecuting, I'm going to be demonizing, and all of the things that we saw, strategies that led up to the genocide. This is the challenge for a while. We've had some discussions with the Ministry of Justice and with the Prosecutor General's Office looking at this 
uh, issue, and even now as we speak, those laws are being refined and uh, uh, really revised so that the, the interest of the society can be protected while at the same time recognizing the need to uh, protect freedom of expression and to continue forward with this human rights uh, regime that is, uh, for the most part, been uh, an asset to countries in the world that struggle with uh, discussion and debate, pull for change, but not to go back to the days of Congora and RTLM and hate radio. This is just the beginning of it, and thank you for your indulgence on it, but it's something that we all want to pay attention to, looking at previous societies, looking at our own society, and to recognize that there are limits to freedom of expression, and setting those limits in Rwanda is a little more challenging than it would be in France, or even in Germany, or the United States. Thank you. The song is written in honor of my good friend, Consoli. On trains, but dark was the night, all of the light went out again. Dark was the night when I couldn't sing. One hundred days passed by, so slow in their time. One hundred wars waged on through all of these cries. Said dark was the night, all of the lights went out in all of the skies. Dark was the night when we couldn't sing. Somewhere in the shadows, I just waited alone. I was only a girl. So small there on my own But then came a light It broke through the loneliest tone There was your face There I was home I wanted to fly so far From all of this pain I wanted to run faster than we on speeding trains, oh, but dark was the night when all of the lights went out in the heavens again. Dark was the night when I couldn't say, so dark was the night when we couldn't sing, so dark was a night till I could sing.